going into the third menu, here we have Live View. Live View is where you hit the LV button to see what the camera is seeing in real time. Contrast AF Live View allows you, in Live View, what type of autofocus do you want? Face recognition, moving object, automatic selection, manual point selection, or central point selection. So in this mode, your camera is going to look for faces and automatically focus on them when you are in live view, only in live view. I use this a lot when I'm doing portrait photos. I'll keep, leave the camera in live view and then I'll use a remote control to autofocus on the person who's posing for the portrait. And uh, this works really, really well and does a good job. This is if you're in live view and you have a moving object like a like a, a speed skater or a bicycle racer or somebody coming from the left or the right of the image or something like that and you want to have the autofocus find the moving subject within the frame and track the moving subject that way. Again, only in live view. Automatic means that your your autofocus is going to work the default way uh, however the camera wants it to work in live view. This mode means that you can select a specific point on the, um, in the frame where you want to have autofocus work. So let's say that you're sitting courtside at your kid's basketball game and you want to get a picture of your kid dunking the ball. So you could set this autofocus point to be on the basket, leave your camera on a tripod, and then it will autofocus on the basket and then take the picture when, you're, when your kid is dunking the ball and it will automatically focus on your kid in the process of dunking. So in this mode, which is the point selection mode, which has this icon, to, to move the point around, you hold down the OK button until you get the triangles on the sides of the square. Now you can see there is a, a frame and that tells you how far the focus point can go. And all you have to do now is move the control pad around and now you've selected what you want your focus point to be. And that box tells you where your focus is going to be. If you want to change it because you're not happy with the framing, you can always just hold down the OK button to go back into it. You can also hit the info button when you're in live view to get to this selection pretty quickly and you can just rotate through your focus types. If you are not in live view, the info button lets you choose which type of AF mode to use. So this last mode right here, which is just the central dot, means that it's the same mode as this one, only you can't adjust that, that focus points location. It will always be in the center. I like to leave this on contrast AF simply because most of the time when I'm in live view I'm going to be taking a picture of a person. Um, if you're not going to be taking a picture of a person, auto or one of the, the other modes will work for your best for your, your uh, scenario. Focus peaking on or off. Now what this does is in live view, uh, again only in live view, this will put a uh, flashing line or a, a bright line around what's in focus. So if you have a person's face over here and a tree over here that are in focus, if they're both in focus, there'll be a, um, a glowing, flashy, bright white line around them. So it helps you obtain very precise focus. Um, I tend not to use it. However, I find it a little bit distracting because I'm, uh, I'm so used to looking to the viewfinder to focus and there's no focus speaking in the viewfinder. But um, if you, if you want to have very precise focus, focus speaking can be a way to help you with that. Grid display. Now, you've seen what I had in live view. I had a rule of thirds grid. That's this selection right here. And you have some different grids you can use. Rule of thirds is very good for general imp image composition. I, I leave it on by default. The rule of thirds with the X is good for um, image composition and also triangular composition if you want to experiment with that. I believe this was also the type of grid that was used in cameras and old film cameras when they used slides to take pictures for television. Um, the crosshairs right here is really good for work with telescopes, extreme telephoto lenses, but also for macro photography. It's very good to um, 
to help get scales and sizes correct. So if you're, for instance, let's say you're, you're into forensics or you're a doctor or, or other medical pr practitioner and you want to get pictures of, of subjects that you can scale accurately, this is a good tool to help you with that. And then of course off is no grid. Histogram display displays the histogram when you're in live view. So you can see down there on the bottom left of the display is the histogram. And that gives me a sense of what my, my composition is going to look like. Highlight alert. That finds highlights in the frame and makes them flash red. So you might be able to see the top right corner of the screen there is flashing red, where I'm pointing it at a light bulb. That just calls out highlights where the image data is so bright that there's not going to be any detail that's uh, viable to, to be retrieved. I tend to leave both of them off. I find them to be distracting. And typically you're going to know if you have highlights because it'll be bright white. And the histogram isn't something that I find to be incredibly useful until I get into post. Um, but that's just a personal preference. Uh, a lot of people find the histogram display to be extremely useful. This next one is electronic level. This is something I find to be extremely useful. I don't use it in the viewfinder. Uh, the viewfinder electronic level uses the exposure scale to give you an idea of, of, of how level you are along the um, horizontal axis, axis. The live view indicator I find to be extremely useful. It's also more accurate. You can see here that this will give you up to six inches of tilt in increments of one inch. So you can still be slightly off, but not, not that much. This gives you nine inches of tilt in increments of a half an inch. And when you're in live view, especially if you're comp composing a landscape image or when I do astrophotography at night, this is extremely useful because, for instance, with astrophotography, there's not a whole lot you can see in live view to give you a sense of, of how you're aligned. So the electronic level uses gyroscopes in the camera and gravity to um, determine whether or not you're level and that helps significantly with composition when you can't see. Um, it also just really with landscapes if you have distortion because of a wide angle lens or perspective the the uh, live view uh, indicators are really good to tell you whether or not you are off um, off plane. So let's see what those look like. Over here on the right and on the top, you can see those blinking indicators. And what those are telling me is that I am not anywhere close to being on plane. So here we are in live view, and you can see my studio light. So such a great photo. Now, when it's green like this, that means I'm that I am properly balanced. When I start to tilt, it's giving me a, a indication of the opposite direction. So there we go. And it tells me X or Y, uh, X and, and Y is for both of them. So let's see if I can get it flat. There we go. And that's what it looks like when it's flat. Uh, two green lines. Automatic horizon correction allows the camera, let's say you are slightly off level, the camera will automatically rotate the sensor to make your image level. I tend to leave it off because um, I found that the shake reduction is not quite as effective with it on. That might just be my perception. I, I could have no, I could be wrong about that, but I perceive that the shake reduction is not quite as good with it on. I also oftentimes am shooting slightly off level to make things that are out of level appear level and I don't want the camera to to outthink me based on gravity. And the reason for that is let's say you have a shoreline and it's close over here and it's far away over here. Well in 3D the way your eyes see it it looks close and far but when you convert it to 2D it looks like it's at an angle. This is exaggerated. We're close and far appear to be sloping downward instead of away. That's just a factor of converting 3D to 2D. So if you rotate the camera slightly, you can bring 
that shoreline back to being horizontal without affecting the way buildings and trees look all that much so that something that is close and far looks like it's flat. But if you have automatic horizon correction on, it doesn't allow you to do that. AA Anti-Aliasing Filter Simulator. What this does is simulate anti-aliasing filters. So non-Pentax cameras come with a piece of glass in front of the, in front of the sensor called an anti-aliasing filter. And what it does is it makes the images softer, but it prevents things like fabric from having a repeated pad, things with a repeated pattern like fabric from creating interference or moiré as it's called in the image. Well, Pentax used to do that, but now they've used, started using their in-camera shake reduction system which moves the filter, the, the sensor around to simulate anti-aliasing filters. Leaving it off gives you the sharpest images you can get out of this camera. Type 1 is a little bit of correction, type 2 is a lot of correction, and then there's bracketing. And bracketing goes boom, 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 three images off type 1, type 2. And I've used this before with portrait shoots, and it's really good when people are wearing, for instance, herringbone shirts or other shirts with, with distinctive patterns like that that can cause uh, moiré patterns. Shake reduction is on and off, whether you want to have it or not. I tend to like it, but it's not necessary. If you're using a, a lens that does not automatically communicate with the camera, you can set the focal length manually. If the lens like the kit lens or other modern Pentax lenses talks to the camera, then it, it knows what the focal length is and you can't adjust that. Alright, image menu 4. Instant review, off. Uh, your selections are off, hold until you manually turn it off, 1, 3, and 5 seconds. I like to have it off because what image review does is you take a picture and then it pops up on the screen. Well, firstly, that drains a lot of battery because your screen's constantly going to show another image. Secondly, it creates the temptation to always look at your picture right after you've taken it. And it's, it's not necessarily a good idea to look at an image right after you've taken it unless you're trying to make sure that what you're trying to take is what's being reflected in your image. So. Um, Rather than reminiscing instantly, it's a good idea just to leave it off and wait until you've gotten through all, all of your images to, or the majority of your images, and then you can go back and look at them. And you'll find that doing that also improves your photography because it, it forces you to trust yourself a little bit more and not be distracted by lots of gizmos and bells and whistles on your camera. Zoom review, uh, what this does is when you go into your your instant review, you can use your zoom button, your command wheels to zoom in and out. Saving raw data. Um, saving raw data gives you the option, if you're only in JPEG, to hit your raw button over here. I believe it's the raw button. Uh, it will tell you which one it is. And convert that JPEG into a raw image, but it only does that for the last image that you've taken. Delete gives you abil the ability to delete through instant review, otherwise you would have to go into the play button. Histogram display, you saw the, dis the histogram display when we looked in live view down here in the bottom left. That shows the histogram of the image in instant review. And highlight alert, you saw the highlight alert where the bright red was flashing up here in live view. Same thing, shows highlights on your instant review. E-dial programming. So your e-dials are these command wheels right here, the front and the back, and then your green button up here on the top of your camera is part of your e-dial programming option. So what this does is the, the, on the left, it tells you your shooting mode, program, shutter priority, uh, I'm sorry, sensitivity priority, shutter priority, aperture priority, and shutter and aperture priority. Here we have manual bulb, video program, video aperture priority, video time and aperture priority, video manual, and we'll get to this one in a bit. So this says, what I want to do is my rear command wheel, which is on the left, will allow me to ch change the shutter, and my front command wheel will allow me to change the aperture, 
and then the green button on the top will reset me to program mode. Oops. This next one here says that in sensitivity priority, the back wheel does nothing. The front wheel allows me to override the, uh, the sensitivity setting to manually set my own ISO, and then the green button does nothing. Shutter or time value shutter priority. That this allows me to change the shutter speed in the other dial and button do nothing. Aperture priority the front dial allows me to change the aperture value in the rear command dial, and green button do nothing. Uh, on, on this one, on TAV, the front command wheel changes time, the back command wheel changes aperture. Same with this, that's the, this is the back command wheel in the middle column. Uh, and then the green button changes it to program. Now let's go into sensitivity priority. So when you hit the, the right arrow, you can go into different, different settings and see what the different th things are doing. Here we go. And then if you push the, the right button on your command pad, now you can assign different preset functions to it. So the back command wheel, I believe this is, or the front command wheel rather would change ISO. The back command wheel would allow you to change exposure value compensation and things like that. So you can't manually set what you want each button to do, but it gives you some options for what you would like the different wheels and green button to do in that mode. This is extremely useful if you're coming over from another system because what you can do is you can set up your KS2 to have a button layout that you're more familiar with if you've been using a system layout which is different from this one. And you can see that in manual, for instance, you can, you can, you can swap the button, button layout and things like that if you would like to. In bulb mode, you can again make different adjustments. Now let's go to the rotation direction, and what this does is this allows you to change the direction of the rotation. So for instance, right now, rotate right means that if you, uh, in, in shutter, shutter priority, rotating this one, the, to the right increases shutter speed. Now rotating it to the left increases shutter speed, and vice versa. So uh, I believe it, def it defaults to rotate to the right. I'm just going to leave it to that because that's uh, what I'm used to and I don't want to completely screw myself up. Okay, button customization allows you to customize four of the buttons. The raw FX button is this one right here on the side. The AF AEL button is this one right here. The AF AEL button is still this one right here, but this function has to do with how it operates in movie mode rather than still mode. And then the self-portrait shutter button, this is what the shutter button does when your screen is flipped so you can sit in front of the camera and see your screen. So your raw effects button, right now, when you're, see if, you, if you're shooting in JPEG mode, let's say, JPEG only, and you're, you're looking at the last JPEG that you took, you can use it to save the JPEG as a raw file. Now this allows you, if you've just taken a really great picture that you really like, you can save the raw image data because it hasn't been purged from the camera yet. And uh, that way you can still edit your best photos in raw, but don't have to edit all of them in raw and can have some raw photos without eating up all of the image uh, space on your card that raw photos can take up because they are huge files. Now if we hit the right button on the command pad here, your raw FX button can also turn on bracketing, can also create an optical preview. Now what this does, optical preview means that when you're looking through the viewfinder, your optical preview is where the aperture stops down to whatever you have it set at so you can have a depth of field preview. This also works in live view, uh, I believe. A digital preview creates a temporary image uh, in, your, in your camera that you can use to actually see what it will look like as an image because the optical preview causes the scene to become very dark. This turns on or turns off shake reduction and this allows you to then adjust the autofocus active area. I tend to leave it on raw um, because it's not a button that I really use, although honestly on the KS2 having it be the optical preview button is really probably the best bet. Um, oh, this is only for within the viewfinder, so not within live view as well. 
I misspoke. Um, this, this Having a depth of field preview is a really good feature to have in a camera, and having it with the raw button is a good choice. So in AF1, what this means is that if you hold down the shutter release button halfway, your camera will autofocus. If you hold down the AF button, your camera will autofocus. Everything works like it should. AF2 disables your shutter button autofocus, so no matter how you push your shutter button, it will not autofocus. You can only autofocus through here. Now that's really good if you're doing uh, work on a tripod with live view for macro work or um, telephoto lens work, landscapes, things like that. And you don't want to risk having the autofocus get screwed up when you actually take the picture with the shutter bu button. It allows you to only focus this way. For things like sports photography, AF2 is not a good choice. Cancel AF. So what this means is that your AF uh, with the shutter button is release is disabled only when you hold this down. So this is basically like autofocus one in functionality, except that when you hold this down, then your your shutter button autofocus will not work. And also that means that this will not autofocus um, when you push it down. So cancel AF, what cancel AF does is your AF button itself will not do any autofocusing. When you, you can only autofocus with your shutter release. When you hold down the AF button, then your shutter will not autofocus. So this is a good option if you have autofocus lock on someone. Let's say you're at a softball game or at a soccer game, and you've either got a batter or a goalie who you want to take a picture of. Well, you've focused on them, and you, you don't want to risk having the focus go to the batting cage or the net behind the person who you want to take the picture of. So you've got them focused, you hold down the AF button, now your autofocus will stick where it's at, and you can take your picture without risking the autofocus changing focus point when you have to press the button. AEL lock, what that does is that says the, um, the exposure value is going to be locked whenever it's pressed. So let's say that you have uh, a situation where you've got a um, a rally car, let's say, coming around a corner, and you know that it's going to be at a certain place. Now it's kind of a shaded place, dim light, and the rally car is bright white. So if that rally car comes into the frame, it's gonna throw off the exposure because it's so light. So what you do is you would set it to this mode and you hold down your AE lock when you're composing your image before the rally car gets there so that you get a properly exposed image where the car comes through and the car looks white instead of looking gray and the background looks dark instead of looking light which uh, or, or, or the, the background rather looks uh, mid-tone instead of looking very dark because the white the white from the car would throw it off. So this allow what this basically does is this says that once once this button is pushed, whatever aperture and shutter speed readings your camera has determined are proper for that metering situation, it will keep those regardless of how the light or scene changes as long as this button is held down. So the next option is uh, movie mode. So, uh, autofocus, auto exposure lock in movie mode. And this has the exact same options as still, and it does the exact same thing as still does, with the exception that once you're recording, the AF will not activate because the AF motor will be picked up by the microphones on the camera or externally. So, the AF is disabled in video mode when recording. Here we have the uh, self-portrait shutter button. And so what this does is this allows you to point the LCD toward you. And when it is pointed toward you, if you're in front of the camera, the shutter button will work when the uh, subject is, when it's set to live view or the shutter button 
will not work when you're in live view. I tend to leave that to on because um, basically they call it self-portrait self mode or selfie mode, but um, if you're taking a picture where the shutter, where the screen might be perceived to be pointing in front of you just because this is the angle at which you want to take the picture for some reason. Uh, I don't want to have to figure out when I'm trying to take a picture how to adjust the shutter um, when I don't, you know, when I'm out in the field. So leaving this to on is probably your safest bet and that's the default when you get the camera out of the box. Memory. So all of these are checked, and what this does is this is everything that your camera can save into your image's EXIF data. What type of flash mode you're using, the type of shooting mode, how, you, how you're driving it, whether it's single shot, image composite, and so forth. What type of white balance you were using, if you had a custom image uh, selection, your, your ISO, your sensitivity. Whether or not you had uh, exposure value compensation, whether you had flash exposure compensation, basically all these different things that we saw in different buttons in video two, and so forth. So basically, you're, you're able through here to select all kinds of things you would or would not like to have in your images EXIF data, which you can then go back and look at. Pentax Forums is a website, for instance, that has a really good EXIF reader where you can upload a file to it and it will give you all kinds of information about that image. Saving user mode allows you to set all of your settings in a certain way in the camera and then save them as either user 1 or user 2 and those are user 1 and user 2 on the dial up here. You can rename the user modes. So instead of user 1 and 2 you could call them um, you know portrait or something like that however long however many characters you have there you could call it portrait or you could call it um, indoor studio or something like that basically you could call it something to trigger your memory as to what it's doing landscapes astrophotography whatever so you could set two different user modes for custom situations that you use frequently and then you could just switch them switch to them on the dial and when you switch to the dial, instead of saying user one on the LCD, it will say whatever you name it to be. And then you have all the settings at your fingertips that you want to use for that special situation that you find yourself in from time to time. Check saved settings. What this allows you to do is go into one of your user, user modes and find out what the saved settings are. And this allows you reset user mode to reset the settings that you've saved. And that is the fourth of four tabs under the image menu system. So this, the movie menu is one tab and this allows you to do all kinds of things in movie mode only. You access movie mode through your on off movie button. You can change your capture setting from full HD to just standard HD if you would like. And you can see the size of the recorded image up here. Whether it's 1920 by 1080 or 1280 by 720. And you can also change your frame rate from as fast as 30 frames per second to as slow as 24. And that also changes how much time you can record, but it's not a huge difference. 30 frames gives you a better image, uh, better video quality. And since you're not really buying yourself a whole lot, going from two hours and seven minutes to two hours and 38 minutes, which means adding a half an hour for every two hours of video time. So what's that? 25% increasing your video record time by 25%. Um, unless you have a very, very tiny video uh, SD card, rather, it's good just to leave it in 30p. And in full HD, you really don't increase your record time by anything. So it's a good idea just to leave it in full HD and then you get the best image quality you can when recording videos with your KS2. Recording sound level allows you to control the on-camera microphone. And I believe that this actually also controls off-camera microphones as well. So you can set it to auto, manual, or mute. And th this, the mute does increase the video record time minimally because you're not recording any sound data as well. 
but manual, and you can see here I'm talking, and this is my talking, you can now gauge how much your video's microphone is going to actually record. So you can set up mic levels. Um, and let's see, as we adjust it, now we can adjust the sensitivity. This, oh, the wrong button, this way. We can adjust the how loud it's going to be. So even though my, my actual voice volume hasn't changed any, the apparent voice volume on the uh, audio uh, video track will change. Oh, and now I'm shouting even though I'm just talking kind of loudly normal. So that's what manual allows you to do. I tend to leave it in auto just because it's a headache I don't have to deal with, but manual is really good if you're sitting in a controlled environment or you want to record soft details and uh, in, in like birds chirping or something like that and make sure that you actually get those recorded uh, sounds in your video. You can also record videos with a digital filter. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? Uh, digital filters work just like we do, uh, just like we saw in um, the, uh, the still images, but for the whole video. HDR capture, yes, you can somehow, I'm not sure how, because it's grayed out, capture HDR videos. You can also enhance your clarity and turn on your image stabilization. Image stabilization does not turn, is always grayed out with the kit lens, but I believe it's on. I think it's just not an option you can select, both for still and um, uh, video. So those are the uh, video capture settings. The play menu controls how your images are displayed when you play them back. So slideshow allows you to turn on and off whether or not the images are just going to automatically play at a set speed. That I believe is grayed out because there are no images on the SD card. Um, I believe that would be white if there were, were images on the SD card. Quick zoom on or off. This sets a default zoom level for you to zoom into when you're playing, when you hit play by hitting the OK button. So if you hit OK, Typically, it either zooms into two or wherever you were the last time. And you can do what you can do is automatically set it so that anytime you hit play, it automatically goes to a 4x zoom or a 16x zoom if you would like. I like off because I want it to go where I was the last time typically um, because I'm, I want to find the same details that I was looking at in a previous image most of the time when I'm going to immediately review an image. Highlight alert is yes and no, so when you're playing back images after you take them, it'll either, it, it, it will or it won't flash red where there's a highlight. Automatic image rotation is a really good option to have checked because if you take a portrait-oriented image, what it will do when you play it back is it'll put black bars on the side and then show the portrait image upright so you don't have to rotate the camera every time you're looking at a uh, portrait than landscape and portrait than landscape oriented image. Protect all images will only light up if you actually have images on the SD card. And what that does is that keeps you from deleting images off the SD card uh, with the camera. Delete all images is the opposite. It deletes every single image on the SD card.